Okay, uh, hello, welcome to uh, our first Tinkerbell Contributors meeting of 2022. Hope you all had a good new year. Uh, excited for what we can do at Tinkerbell this coming year. Uh, we've started recording, we've notified Slack. Thanks again, Jeremy. Um, if you're coming to us later on, the, please do find the agenda uh, doc here in the, in the chat. There's a code of conduct. Please do check that out. Uh, looks like we don't have any show and tell topics in the agenda. Anybody have any show and tell topics they wanted to bring up? Go once, twice. All right, no worries. Uh, topics, we have one item here. We post it into the Zoom chat. I'm not familiar with this, so please do uh, check out this link. Let's see, does anybody on the call put this in? Do they know what they wanted to chat about here? It's like it's a PR. Uh, Mark, you to put that in there. Oh, okay. Um, it's got two approvals on it. Um, I see Mark, you made a comment. We're having a community meeting tomorrow. I will add this PR to the agenda. Thank you for your work. Okay, maybe I'll just uh, invite everybody real quick to read over this and see if there's any concerns or questions. For those of you all that just joined, welcome. And also I just put in the chat again, uh, we are reviewing this PR in Tinkerbell Hub. Um, see if there's any concerns or questions. What do we, what is our stance on test for hub actions? Question. Don't know. Yes, we don't have one because <laughs> I don't see any tests. Um, it'd be nice to have regression tests. Yeah, definitely. Looking at the GitHub actions. Yeah, I don't see, there's some CI checks, which I don't know. Make CI, see what make CI does. Runs hack CI checks. That's starting to feel like just like linting and stuff, but. Uh, right. Like, so, I mean, I guess what we're talking about is having like sort of standards that would, like for um, actions accepted to the hub, we need to have testing, right? Because the actions could be written in all manner of different things and use different stuff, right? So I don't know that we're looking to dictate that. Like, like th this seems like a great fix, right? Like, I don't want invalid file systems, please. But like, uh, I'll, I also would uh, like to to be able to prove that this does handle a file system correctly, and or or maybe even not necessarily a file system, just a tar correctly, right? Um, yeah. There, there is. I did link in the chat. There, there is. Uh, Go test is being run. Um, so there is that, um, but uh, to James's point, actually, uh, if you don't didn't write it in Go, then this wouldn't have been captured. Uh, you probably wouldn't have had any test run. But yeah, I, I don't want to penalize someone for 
PR author for not for us not having infrastructure set up for that. But it would be it would be nice to have that. Do we have an issue for that? We should probably capture that somewhere. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, since we didn't have the standards, I would say that like we shouldn't really hold this person to them. Sure. I think we do have, at least in the PR template, right? There's like, how has this been tested? So, um, yeah, at a minimum, there is, we have the ability to ask them if they've done some type of testing. And they appear to have answered that question. Yeah, very thoroughly. Yeah. This uh, comes uh, what comes to my mind too. And I, I don't want to um, add this. I'll bring up this discussion maybe in another uh, agenda topic, or maybe next time. But uh, it, it seems like uh, ownership of the hub and, and how we kind of go about stuff should be addressed and brought up. Um, there's lots of actions in here, right? Do we have people who are willing to kind of steward these through? I think someone that's kind of watching these and responsible might be helpful instead of uh, the old adage, how do you starve a horse? You tell two people to give it water or something like that, right? So. I have, um, I guess, maybe two concerns. Um, I'd read a blog post by someone that said uh, something about Go's um, ar archive tar functionality, not uh, validating file paths. So, you know, it'll just kind of untar things wherever, you know, whatever's inside the tar file, which I know we're, this is, this change is trying to add authentication to, you know, authenticate the tar file, but I think it's still a something maybe to think about. Um, I just put a link to the blog post and the Zoom chat, which I can put in the in the notes too. <clears throat> but uh, that's maybe something. If I had more time, I would look at it. But just off the top of my head, that's something to think about. Um, and then the other thing is. I wonder if this should be optional at all, like if it should be required, but I don't, I don't know anything about this feature, so. Apologies, can you tell me what, what's the concern with Go's extra uh, archive tar library? If the, so my understanding is uh, if the, if the file paths in the, in the tar are just like, if someone put like a, a relative file path of like dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, and then some files, uh, the Go, uh, well, the Go library will just, will actually go and do that. It'll just go back to the root of the file system and then drop the file on top of whatever's there. So it's, even if you're authenticating the tar, it's still something to think about just because the, the file might get dropped on top of something important potentially. So there's a security concern that you know, you might end up with a malicious tar that's just overwriting uh, important things on the file system. Does that make sense? Speaking yeah. from experience, like when you do Kubernetes, if you if you use Kubernetes, well, kubectl cp, it's a hack on tar. It basically just calls tar in the container image to like tar something up, and then well, like it actually exacts the the tar. Um, it execs the tar in the container and then on the client side untars it and there's been like i think it was i guess it was 20 either 2019 or 2020 there were like five cves in kube cuddle for untar issues not fun <laughs> um yeah like where it would like get outside the path that you know that you're expecting to untar into um like malicious sim links and stuff um so yeah i speaking from experience totally can validate that if not naive usage of goes untar is uh can have issues uh I, yeah i think i'm curious how how much do we weigh that 
this is a machine. So the, the the happy path right here is that this is a machine you're trying to provision an operating system on. You have full access already. You are root when you run these things. Um, how do we take that into account? Does it does it affect what we how we view this concern at all? That like well, you have already full access to the, the device. You're trying to lay out disk things, right? You're doing all root type privileges. And we don't have a non-root type um, separation in Tinkerbell quite yet. How does that change the color of this topic? I guess it's all about how it's being used, right? This is just an archive to disk, right? I'm not familiar with all the specifics of uh, what other functionality it has, but I guess at the bare minimum, it on TAR is a TAR file to uh, already formatted mounted disk. So, uh, I mean, conceivably, you know, our use case right now is provisioning machines, right? There's nothing there, we put stuff there, great. But maybe somebody's using this to put something on top of something that's already there, right? And then a malicious tar file that maybe you're consuming these tar files from the public at large in some fashion, right? Um, maybe this is, a, you know, tarartifacts.org or something, and that's a little uh, artifact hub for tar files or something. I don't know, that's somebody. And then that's, that's, that's how that could be a problem for people. Um, unexpectedly, right? Uh, obviously everything's running as root, but like maybe they're ingesting content, but I don't know if that's really our problem to solve. Uh, maybe it's our problem to like alert people to this possible um, exposure, you know, yeah. and then it's an exercise for the user to uh, deal with it. I think, I think an overall security story for Tinkerbell as a project is like documenting a threat model. Like to what, exactly what you're saying, James. Like we are assuming that you're running this with trusted TARs on a machine that already has or with the tink worker that already has like full access you're not you know like doing tinkerbell as a service on some kind of shared hardware with like you know, composite tars or take, taking untrusted <laughs> tars or something right like but we don't have to give all those things we're not assuming but just the things that we are assuming for hub for for hub actions and then also for just team you know as a whole um, in each component within that. I think documenting that threat model will help. It will mitigate, not mitigate, it will help users of Tinkerbell understand what we consider the threat model. So if someone comes along and says, hey, look what I found, because someone will eventually, which is fine and good. Like we want to make those things better, but um, we'll have a, I have a tone to set and say, okay, did you read this thing? Because that's sort of not, that's sort of considered out of bounds. Yeah, I do like that. I think making more explicit maybe in our PRs or something, especially in the hub, right? To document around assumptions would be a good thing. Good stuff. Thanks, Stephen. Any any other thoughts, comments, concerns around this uh, around this PR? Uh, just whether or not it should be actually optional. I don't know if anyone had any opinion on that. Oh, spe uh, uh, the, having the to specify the shots. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. I mean. Uh, what is your gut feeling there, Stephen? I, I wish I knew more about the feature because that might inform my advice there a little bit more, but mm -hmm. I, I think I'd rather see it be required. Um, maybe there'd be a way to disable it and you'd have to be explicit about it. Yeah, but I agree with you. I, it's just the tar file. I, I think it's not a big burden. It's just make it required. Yeah, I, I think I'm an escape hatch would be good. Even more. An escape hatch would be good if you trust TLS and DNS. But um, if you have TLS and DNS, you know, if you're if you're downloading from a, a publicly CA signed thing and you trust your TLS chain. But yeah, I agree. Could I invite you, Stephen, to? Or anybody else that uh, had that opinion, maybe to comment on the on the the PR. Maybe we push this one through, and they come back around. Um, those are options as well, possibly. Without, but this all seems like really good uh, feedback 
if uh, people were, with um, opinions wouldn't mind just throwing a quick comment on there, appreciate it. The uh, last yeah, thing sure. is maybe from a Semver perspective, make, leaving it not required without bounce, without bumping the Semver so that unless, or, or saying we're gonna bump the Semver and make it required, but you wouldn't wanna, it, it, making it required and not, and not bumping the Semver version to indicate that would be bad. Agreed. Right on, awesome. Any other, any final thoughts, comments there? Sweet. All right, thanks y'all. Any other topics to bring up? I, I apologize, I had a topic, I moved it to discussion. I, I apologize, the, the, the break has made my brain a little fuzzy here. I don't get which goes where, but uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, discussions, we don't put discussion items like brand new ones here. Those are from like existing things we find in like triage parties. That, does anybody know if that's accurate? That was that was the original intent, but there's no rules. That's fair. I'll move mine. I, I will. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll move mine too, just because I I apologize, I wasn't thinking there. Okay, all right. I'll turn it over to Micah then. PB and J proposal. Ooh, fourth cover. Uh, yeah. About so this. this was this was kind of bumped like from the whole like Kubernetes proposal, just to keep separate concerns. Right now, PB and J is like a gRPC service. Um which I think is probably fine. Um, I guess I just wanted to kind of give folks a heads here, a heads up. Um, I probably will be working on a uh, proposal for building out more PB and J functionality, as well as maybe like um, hub actions that would interact with that. So you'd basically have like, think like a worker, but that's not a on a machine. It'd be more like a controller worker um, that would be long lived and be able to bridge. Oh, I see this, you know, workflow action to power machine. Okay, I'm going to take those inputs from that because uh, from that action because actions are basically definitions of containers, right? Um, take that workflow action and reach out to PBAJ and tell it to power on a machine, mount from you know, mount ISO over IPMI or um, set to netboot, whatever, whatever I need to do. Um, that's kind of the, the intended idea right now. Um, again, still like to, to be written and, and hasn't been published yet or anything, but just wanted to give folks a heads up that that's probably coming soon. That's exciting. I just posted in the agenda under your topic. Um, I, I had this idea a while back too. And so I started building something I called VMC tool. It took out the gRPC stuff of uh, pb and and just used the backend library. And it's a CLI, which would make it easier to kind of plug into an action. Um, I, I, I apologize, I started it. It's definitely not uh, um, finished by any means, but there is some work already done. If it's helpful, definitely feel free to grab, copy, paste or whatever is needed. So I put the link in the agenda notes. Yeah, I don't see Manny here, but um, I think I've heard Manny discuss other similar ideas around uh, having a workflow that can cause machines to be power cycled without the machine that is being provisioned having access to the IPMI credentials. Um, so I think his he was talking about a privileged worker or something, but same idea. Uh, so if you get to it before before we do, then all the better for everyone. Yeah, the, the other sort of thought could be Rather than a, if you have a privileged worker, you still have to download and run arbitrary containers, which is a little funky. Um, it could also be you just have a worker that mock or PBNJ itself is a worker that knows how to execute specific actions, but it doesn't actually pull a container, it just does stuff. Um, like a, the image would be a named 
function or something in the PB&J code, and it wouldn't actually pull a container image and run it. It's kind of a hack. I mean, the, the big question is whether this is, so, so on the one hand, if powering um, power cycling machine and BMC in general is a very specific thing that's the only one of its kind, then you could imagine writing support for a specialized worker and a specialized action and having those two wired together correctly. Uh, but I think there may be other use cases for having access to interesting secrets on behalf of the, be the machine being provisioned where, uh, I think what comes to mind on, on our end is network configuration of the, the port that the machine is connected to. So some sort of generality there may still be valuable. Um, and I don't know exactly how that plays out, but just putting the ideas in people's heads. Yeah, good stuff there. Cool, any other comments or? Feedback there? Tweet, thanks, Micah. Uh, I had one discussion item. Uh, so um, last year in December, the boots dash iPixie repo was created. This uh, was part of proposal 22 to pull out um, and to make uh, the layers more clear around boots and what it's doing. And so this is pulled out all of the iPixie code. Uh, the repo was initially named boots-ipixie. Um, I'll, I'll post the, the issue for discussion here. There, there's a concern around the naming of the repo. And so two of its stated goals is to be a Go library and to be a CLI. And being a Go library, and having the name as it is, you always have to rename its import. Um, and the general Go maintainers have said good package names should not require naming. So I propose that we change the name to Tinkerbell iPixie. Um, I know Marcus had, I appreciate, thanks for posting your comments in the issue itself, but there's some uh, concern about naming. So I just wanted to bring it up again here real quick. I'm proposing we just call it iPixie, but I uh, wanted to get thoughts and feedback from others. Or not, and I'll just change it later today. <laughs> I, I left to comment with my thoughts is that may, maybe we could put the iPixie into a folder and that would, um, that might make it, uh, it, that would fix your import problem. <clears throat> um, and it would keep the boots dash prefix, uh, which I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily fighting for it. What did, did um, you need to fix the boots dash prefix on the other repos that came out of boots or was this the only one that's been moved so far? Yeah, first one so far. Yeah. Um, and another thought is even if we do rename it to Pixie, maybe the, the paths can, still be modified. So I, I left like two suggestions to, to consider. One is put the ipixie.go inside of an ipixie folder since everything else in there is inside of a folder. And the other is maybe make a servers folder and then put the HTTP, TFTP and ipixie inside of that. Um, just other ways to organize it. Um, but yeah, no strong opinion. It, the only thing I was trying to avoid is the, the case where somebody thinks that this is like the iPixie, um, like the official i, the official the, the main iPixie server of the internet, and it's oh. like a big specific <laughs> one. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. So there's actually nothing specific to Boots in it. So um, there is no connections to Boots or to Tinkerbell. The way it's architected and built, it doesn't. It doesn't talk to Tink server. It has no backends. It just serves by iPixie binaries via TFTP or HTTP. So um, it might not be the worst thing if somebody said, "Hey, I'm going to run this just by itself." Right. So there is no yeah. boots again. There is no boots specific stuff in here at all. We will obviously use it. Boots will be a client of this library, but uh, 
there isn't anything Tinkerbell specific, but I, I like that idea. If if a, a name, a generic name like that does have some Tinkerbell specific thing to it, then maybe we call it out in some specific way so people know it's not a generic tool X, right? I, I like that idea. Or it's like having like an HTTP daemon and calling it HTTPD and just like sticking that in here or FTPD, like there's, there's room for that name to be confused with other services with the same name. So what, how does this stand out other than read the readme yeah. or look at the organization? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Oh, a late breaking name idea. I like this. I pixie dust. That would give us a nice Tinkerbell tie. And you could that 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 could solve that that could satisfy both of these kind of concerns. I kind of like that, Jason. Very good suggestion. It a, makes the eye stand out for me. It's more like an eye robot kind of thing now. No, I want to know what that means. <laughs> the eye before the eye picks you mean it, it kind of yeah, it segregates like it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, I I actually like this quite a bit. I don't know how much in jest this was, Jason, but uh, I actually might. Would there be any objections if I actually did call it iPixie Dust? I haven't really been listening, but could it just be called Dust? Could it's an option. I think you lose context in terms of just like the uh, the library type name, right? Then you get functions called dust dot serve, and now you, it might be a tad bit confusing. Like, what am I serving? Um, I pick, if you put the iPixie in there, it gives it a little more context around you know what am I serving as a library. But yeah, okay. I just thought I'd mention it. That's fair. All right, I we won't, can uh, rewrite it in Rust. We can make it iPixie Rust. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, last last call for objections. I think later today I will change it to iPixie Dust. See how that goes. This is not set in stone. We call it Boots iPixie Two. We can we can change it. It's it's. I, I have a draft PR in Boots to get this all plugged together. So there's. Even once it does fall into boots, I, again, I think we're a small enough group, we should be able to change it and update it, so. All right, we'll belabor this one anymore. Thanks, if any other concerns, please do reach out. All right. Uh, no other topics, any other ad hoc things anybody would like to bring up before we go to discussion items? All right, let me click on this discussion items real quick, see what we got. Uh, hmm. That means I have to know how to read triage party because there's a lot going on here. Um, Marcus, can I solicit your help here? I'm looking in triage party for labels of Triage discuss. Do you know how I do that? The link just brings me to a bi weekly. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah, clicking around. I, I don't know. I, I think if you can find an issue that has it, maybe we could click on nope. Tags okay. are clickable. Are the labels clickable? If you find something that's already got that label. Um, Hmm. Actual labels don't seem to be clickable. I don't even actually see any. Oh, duh, I got to read it. And the top it says items for discussion, no matching items. Okay, never mind. So we just don't have any items. <laughs> I'll use that. Okay. <clears throat> that is all we have on the agenda. Any other topics? Jokes? Sweet. 
Uh, next week, same time, triage party if you're interested. Um, otherwise, thanks for all the contributions. Appreciate all the, the interactions. See y'all online. Have a good one.